Hello lovelies, my name is Caitlin and welcome to another episode of True Crime with Caitlin. Today we're going to be discussing the case that led to the final two executions in the UK. This is the murder of John Allen West. <laughs> It was 3am on the 7th of April 1964 when Joseph Fawcett and his wife were awoken by the sound of heavy thuds. They both lay and just kind of listened for a minute, hearing another two or three thuds before realising they were coming from the house next door. Joseph would later describe what he heard, saying, quote, Heavy thuds, as though something was hitting the foundation of the house, and I can sort of recollect a shill scream. Joseph rose out of bed and peered out of his window, and in the reflection of the house opposite, he could see his neighbour's lights flickering on and off. Concerned with what he was hearing and seeing, Joseph and his wife quickly threw on their coats and went to investigate to see what was going on. By the time they reached their door, the street would be filled with the sound of a revving engine and rear car lights speeding off into the darkness. The Fawcett's made their way over to their neighbour's house to see if everything was okay. They knocked on the door and waited. Nothing. They knocked again, but still no one was coming to the door. Joseph tried the handle, but found that the door was locked. He even made his way back over to his house and began braying on the wall that connected their semi-detached homes to try and awake his neighbour. But again, they were being met with silence. So at around 3.30am, police were called. Officers arrived at 28 Kings Avenue in Seaton, Workington, which is in Cumbria, and were met with the Fawcett, who relayed their concerns onto officers. Although by now, they were worried that they were making a fuss out of nothing. Maybe the thuds were innocent and their neighbour was just sleeping. Officers did just as Joseph had before. They knocked on the doors, they tried opening them, but of course, they were locked. Now this was worrying because surely all of this commotion should have woken up the man inside if he was in fact just sleeping. I don't know if you've ever had a policeman knocking on your door but they are very loud, hard to ignore, impossible to sleep through. The officers were discussing breaking down the door to get inside when Mrs Fawcett told them there was no need. She knew where there was a spare key kept to the home. If her neighbour was expecting an electrician or anything like that while he was out, he would ask Mrs Fawcett to let them into his home so she knew where he kept his spare key. Mrs Fawcett retrieved it from a nail box inside of his garage and handed it over to the sergeant. The sergeant opened the door and stepped inside of the house, closely followed by Joseph, who at the sight of a pool of blood fainted. There, lay at the bottom of his stairs, was the body of 53-year-old John Allen West. John, who went by Jack, was born in 1911. He was a bachelor who enjoyed spending his free time going to his local pub. He was a keen darts player. He was once part of a darts team for the Globe Inn pub. Jack was also a handyman. He enjoyed doing some gardening and his favourite thing to do was tinkering around with his car. He drove a grey and cream Austin Westminster saloon and this car was his pride and joy. It was his baby. He lived what was described as a steady, simple life. He had worked for Lakeland Laundry for 34 years, so since he was only 19 and he was a van driver for them. On the 25th anniversary of Jack work and for Lakeland Laundry, they gifted him a 17 jeweled Trebex gold watch, which had his name engraved into it. When he received it, it cost £25, which with inflation, that would be over £500 now, so it's safe to say he was a very well-liked, valued employee. 
Since the recent death of his eight-year-old mother, Jack lived alone at 28 Kings Avenue. Monday the 6th of April was an ordinary day for Jack West. He went to work driving the laundry van, finishing at about 5.30pm. He dropped off one of his co-workers and got himself back home at about 6pm. Only nine and a half hours later, Jack West would be found dead. The sergeant who entered the home would describe what he saw, saying, quote, I saw the body of a man lying on the floor at the foot of the stairs. The body was on its back, dressed in only a shirt and vest. The body was at an angle to the staircase. There were severe head injuries, there was a large amount of blood on the floor, and the man was obviously dead. There was also quite a lot of blood on the staircase. It appeared that a struggle had taken place. The officers done a very brief look around the house to see if it was empty or if there were any suspects hid out somewhere. When it was found to be emptied, they radioed for backup at 3.45 a.m. Detective Inspector John Leslie Gibson arrived at the scene at about 4.30 a.m. He watched as a doctor conducted a very brief examination of Jack's body, where he found, quote, life to be extinct, and estimated that the murder had happened very recently within the last two hours. D.I. John Gibson then done his own walk through the house. He found no signs of forced entry, both doors to the house being locked, along with all the windows being closed and locked. This told him that whoever murdered Jack was likely welcomed into the home, meaning Jack must have known his killer. Not many people would accept strangers into their home in the dead of night. Inside the kitchen, Jack had set out a frying pan along with some bacon, presumably ready for his breakfast when he got up in the morning. The house hadn't been ransacked and there was nothing that stuck out to tell them that Jack had been robbed. The only notable thing was a cabinet in the sitting room. The cabinet or sideboard, whatever you want to call it, had one of its doors opened along with the bottom drawer. I have posted a picture of this and other crime scene photos on the Instagram at True Crime Caitlin Pod if you want to go see it. So that specific door and drawer being open could suggest that whoever opened them was looking for something specific, something they knew was there, and it probably wasn't Jack who opened them because whoever did left in such a hurry that they didn't close the drawer and door. Inside of the sitting room, there was a 12-inch bit of pipe that had been wrapped in some pyjama bottoms. Several nails slash bolts were found surrounding Jack's head, and there were some under his body too. At the top of the stairs, D.I. John Gibson found a metal poker and the bottom half of a set of dentures which had belonged to Jack West. There was a substantial amount of blood found on Jack's body, the floor beneath them, splattered up the walls and even some on the roof, indicating that this was an incredibly vicious killing. The scene would be described by some as a bloodbath. Jack was formally identified by his cousin, John Grisdale, who he was extremely close to. They had once lived together after John had moved in with Jack and his parents for a short time when they were much younger. Jack's postmortem was being conducted in Carlisle by pathologist Dr. Falls. The examination would reveal that Jack had sustained a stab wound to the left side of his chest, which pierced his heart. This was likely inflicted with a knife or dagger. He had 13 split wounds all across his head. They likely came from being beaten with a kosh. If you're like me and you don't know what a kosh is, a kosh is a thick, heavy stick or bar used as a weapon. Jack also had grazing slash bruising to his face, head, chest and left arm and he had bruising to the brain. Dr. Falls would determine Jack's cause of death, saying, quote, In my opinion, death resulted from hemorrhage and shock caused by stab wounds into the heart and multiple head injuries. The discovery of this stab wound was kept very close to the chest. At the scene, it appeared that Jack had only been bludgeoned and that is what the news would later report so officers knew that the only other person who could possibly know about the stab wound would be the killer. 
quite quickly these officers knew they were out of their depth and they would need help if they were going to solve this case so they reached out for assistance Lancashire Constabulary would provide fingertip and forensic experts and Carlisle Constabulary provided experienced detectives a lot of the investigation from now is happening simultaneously so if it seems like I'm going back and forth at any point when I describe it I apologise in advance at the scene officers began conducting door-to-door -door inquiries an elderly woman would describe hearing banging which she compared to quote a noise like someone chopping wood so a similar ish statement to the faucets they would learn more about jack's character he was all around well liked no one really had a bad word to say about him it was known that he never really had any female friends which led some people to speculate whether he was gay although we'll never know they also learned that Jack wasn't short of money. So here are two potential motives. If Jack was a gay man, could his murder have been a hate crime? Or if he was well known to have money, could this have been a robbery gone wrong? The scene didn't really tell them that, but it is something to keep in the back of their minds. Inside of the house, investigators discovered an off-white coloured raincoat. Sources conflict whether it was found on Jack's bed or on the banister at the bottom of the stairs. Either way, this coat didn't belong to Jack. Inside of the pocket, there was a bunch of keys. There was a Royal Life Saving Society medallion and on the back it had G. O. Evans engraved. The RLSS is a drowning prevention charity and someone is usually awarded a bronze medallion after proving they have many skills including swimming skills, knowledge of aquatic safety, rescue skills and so on. Investigators contacted the RLSS who reported having no records of a G O Evans. Inside the pockets they also found a bit of paper which had a woman's address scribbled down on it. This was a Liverpool address, so Liverpool police would head over to 98A Upper Hill Street where they were met with 17-year-old Norma O'Brien. They questioned her about the medallion, if she would recognise it at all, and she believed that she did. They didn't take a picture, I believe, they were just verbally describing it to her. Norma told officers that the year prior, 1963, she had spent a couple of weekends in Preston with her sister, who was married to a soldier stationed at Fullwood Barracks, which is in Preston. In November 1963, while she was there with her sister, she had a little thing with a man that she knew as Ginger Owen Evans. They met up a couple of times and very briefly dated but it didn't go much further because he was talking about getting married and everything like that which Norma wasn't looking for at that time. However she did recall that he had once showed her a similar sounding bronze medallion. By the 8th, the day after the murder, Norma was driven to a halfway house in Kendall where she was presented with the medallion and without a shadow of a doubt she recognised it, saying quote, I remember the colour of the buttons is similar, there is a split in the back which is similar and it had similar straps on both cuffs. I also remember the red and black coloured check lining. Norma's house back in Liverpool was then placed under surveillance in case Ginger Owen Evans decided to show up at his old flame's house looking for somewhere to go. Although Norma had no reason to think he would even show up there because they hadn't seen each other in many months by this point. On the afternoon of the 8th of April, Ormskirk Police Station received a phone call from a woman named Elizabeth Boyers. She was making a report to police after a man had showed up at her address on Nolsey Road at around 4.20pm that afternoon. She answered the door and this man questioned her either about her yard or a builder's yard very close to her home. This man explained to Elizabeth that he had been travelling from London and that his car was starting to overheat so he's essentially asking her if he can leave the car on this yard for a bit to cool down. She said he could and off he went. Elizabeth had a good feeling that something wasn't right, which is why she was contacting the police. 
She described the man as being 25 or 26, around 5 foot 5, having sharp features and sandy hair, and that his demeanour was agitated. Because Lancashire Constabulary, who Ormskirk Police fall under, were aware of Jack's murder and the fact that the killer had got away in a car, this call from Elizabeth piqued their interest immediately, especially because of Elizabeth's description of this man, saying that he had sandy hair, matching Norma, describing the owner of the medallion as Ginger. I hope you managed to follow us there. Detectives arrive at Elizabeth's home to take a look at the car and nothing immediately stood out. The car wasn't ransacked or blood soaked, there was no signs of blood at all really. Fingerprint examinations were conducted before the car was seized by police. After running the registration, they would find that the car had been reported as stolen from a house all the way back in Preston. As this was going on, other investigators were requesting and then combing through army records. Norma mentioning that she had met up with Ginger Owen Evans in Preston near the barracks meant that he could have possibly been a soldier too. I don't know if he had told Norma that he was a soldier and then she relayed that onto police or not. But by doing this, they were able to find the name of their man. Gwyn Owen Evans was born on the 1st of April 1940 in Maryport, Cumberland, which is now just Cumbria. He was the oldest of three surviving children from his parents, Thomas and Hannah Walby. He did have an older brother and sister who had sadly passed away. Gwyn was born and christened under the name John Robson Walby, however later in life he started going by the name Gwyn, which is what I'm going to keep calling him to not confuse anything. Gwyn had troubles with his mental health from a very young age. When he was 10, he was taken to Dovenby Hall Mental Colony in Cockermouth, where he was described as, quote, showing a vivid imagination, which in part was due to lack of toys supplied to him as a child. Gwyn was also a compulsive liar. He would just lie about the most random of things for no rhyme or reason. For example, he would later claim that he could fluently speak nine different languages, but couldn't recite anything when asked. He would claim that his name change from John Walby to Gwyn Evans came after he discovered that he was adopted. He believed that he was born in Austria and that his real parents were German and so this name change was to honour his real family. This wasn't the case at all though, it was a totally fabricated lie. He wasn't born in Austria, he wasn't adopted. Besides this, Gwyn's early life was described as relatively normal. He attended primary and secondary school in Maryport, where he had what was considered below average intelligence. He would just say scrape C grades in all of his work, which now, under the new grading system, is like him getting a number four. After leaving school, he would jump from job to job. He had once worked as a page boy in a hotel, as an engine cleaner, a kitchen porter, a lift attendant, a driver. He enlisted in the British Army under Border Regiment in 1957, but was discharged after only a month. He then went on to join the Royal Air Force, and by now, he is going by the name Gwyn Owen Evans. So potentially, he just changed his name to try and get back into the forces. Again, that didn't last long though, he continued jumping from job to job and I'm not going to detail them all because we would be here all day. On the 31st of March 1963, Gwyn would arrive at an acquaintance's home in Carlisle with the hopes of selling this person a watch because he was in desperate need of some money. This person made the mistake of leaving the room for just a couple of minutes and within that very short space of time, Gwyn had stolen four half crown coins from a jacket that was hung up and then fled. Four half crown coins would be the equivalent of about 50 pence today. This person reported the theft to police who soon caught up to Gwyn Evans. For this theft and several other things, he would be taken to court he received a sentence of four days detention and was ordered to pay a £5 fine, which with inflation would be just over £85 today. 
by January 1964, Gwyn had made a new friend who would become his literal partner in crime, Peter Allen. Peter Anthony Allen was born in Wallasey, Merseyside on the 4th of April 1943. He was the second son from his parents. Grown up, Peter had trouble with his hearing, which had a knock-on effect. It also interfered with his speech, meaning he was a bit behind most of his peers, both socially and academically. He was delayed starting school, and when he did eventually start, teachers would describe him as, quote, quiet and cooperative, but unstable and lacking in thoroughness. After leaving school, he, like Gwyn, would jump from job to job, never really lasting more than a month anywhere. He eventually enrolled in the army as a junior gunner when he was 16, and here, he would be well regarded, being described saying his quote, military conduct was fair, but his character was good, he was well-mannered, cheerful, honest, sober, and trustworthy. Peter would be dismissed from this job after 11 months of starting, simply because he wasn't needed anymore. It was in 1960 that Peter began getting into trouble with the law. That August, he was in court for aiding and abetting a car and use of it without insurance. For this, he received 12 months conditional discharge. This means that he wasn't given a sentence or any sort of punishment for these charges. However, if he was in trouble again within a certain amount of time, he would get it then. While attending a fair at New Brighton, Peter Allen would meet Mary Irene Gannett. Mary was an 18-year-old single mother who worked part-time in a cinema. The couple clicked and would go on to marry at Corpus Christi Church and School. In November 1962, Peter, Mary and Mark, Mary's son who Peter would love and bring up as his own, all upped and moved to Preston. Peter and Mary would expand their family, going on to have their own son who they named Richard. In 1964, 24-year-old Gwyn and 21-year-old Mark would commit their first crimes together. They broke into a building and stole the contents of a cigarette machine. They stole a car and a van and they also stripped all of the lead from an empty house. And only three months later, they would commit murder together. Following extensive investigation into Gwyn's army and criminal records, investigators were able to track him down to a house at 2 Clarendon Street, Preston, the home of Peter and Mary Allen. When officers arrived, they knocked on the door and were met with Peter Allen. When asked if Gwyn was there, Peter would say he wasn't. He'd been out since about 10am that morning, apparently to go and try and find a job. Peter's children were heard inside of the house and he made an offhand comment about his wife also being out. Now this is where I'm going to cut in and take us back a little bit. So, Peter saying that both Gwyn, who he nicknamed Sandy, and his wife Mary were both out was interesting to police as they had received intelligence that a man and a woman had been into a bank and withdrawn a total of £10 from Jack West's account. So, Peter Allen is putting both Gwyn and Mary out of the house, potentially and likely it was them withdrawing the money. The police officer asked Peter if he would come down to Preston Borough Police Station just to answer a couple of questions. Peter didn't refuse, but he didn't want to go until he was assured that his children were going to be looked after. Once that was cleared up, he voluntarily went with the officers. Somehow during the car journey, it was decided that instead of going to Preston Station, they were now going to make their way to Workington, closer to where Jack was murdered. During this journey, Peter asked the officers what was going on, and when he was told he was going to be questioned regarding a murder, he replied, quote, That's alright, I've got nothing on my conscience. I was at home all Monday night with Sandy, my wife, and two kids, and on Tuesday, I was home by myself with the two kids. 
Police who had been out searching for Mary managed to track her down in Manchester somehow. When they finally found her, they asked her where Gwyn was and she offered to take them to where she thought he could have been. She led officers to Phillips Park Road where at 5.10pm, Gwyn Evans was found and arrested. He was taken to a police station and when he was searched, they found two massively important pieces of evidence. Inside of the lining of his jacket, police found Jack West's gold watch. The watch that he was gifted from Lakeland Laundry that had his name engraved on the back, although Gwyn had tried to scratch it out. There was no reasonable explanation for Gwyn to be in possession of this watch unless he had stolen it. They also found a driver's license that belonged to the man who reported his car missing, the car that ended up on Elizabeth Boyer's drive. Gwyn having access to this car means that he had the means to get to Jack's house to commit the murder, so this was just another piece of the puzzle. Before we proceed getting into the interrogations, I'm going to take you through the connection between Jack West and Gwyn Evans and how Jack sadly became his target. So, back in 1961, Gwyn Evans had dated the daughter of a man named William Hampton. One day, Gwyn arrived at William's home to either show him his new car or to take a look at William's new car, the car being a Sunbeam Talbot. Gwyn and William were sat inside of the car when Jack West, who was working driving the laundry van, arrived. Being the car nut that he was, he couldn't resist coming over to admire the vehicle and to talk about it. This was the first time Jack and Gwyn met. They became friendly with one another and formed a very close relationship. They became so friendly that Jack allowed Gwyn to drive his own car, which like I said earlier, this was his baby. People weren't even allowed to sit in it, never mind drive it. So Jack must have really trusted and liked Gwyn. One of his co-workers at Lakeland Laundry noticed Gwyn driving Jack's car and he would have Jack's life about it, saying he's got a young chauffeur now. Just harmless joking on. Jack would often speak fondly about Gwyn calling him a comical lad. It was also said that Jack would help Gwyn out financially if he needed a small loan or help in buying something. Jack would happily help his friend. So that is the link, that is how the two men knew of each other. After being arrested on suspicion of murder and read his rights, Gwyn Evans offered police his version of what had happened. Within the book The Last Two to Hang, author Elwyn Jones details all of the interrogations, so if you're interested in reading all of the statements fully, I would totally recommend going ahead and reading that book, it's very interesting. What I'm about to read here is Gwyn's first statement. So he said, quote, Jack West had been a friend of mine for five years and he told me if I was ever short of money, he would always lend me a couple of quid. I knew he had a load of cash and so did Peter. We all went up to Workington that night. Here he is referring to Peter, Mary and the two children, not Jack. We left Preston at half past ten in a car we took from Preston. We got to Jack's about three in the morning. I left Peter, Mary and the two kids in the car and I went to the door. Jack was already up and he let me in. He said I was lucky to find him up but he had a headache and he had come down and make some tea. I had some tea and a cheese bun. Whilst we were talking there was a knock at the door. I honestly didn't know who it was. Anyway, Jack went to the door and I heard some banging. I went into the hall and I saw Peter hitting Jack with something that looked like a pipe. Peter had Jack in the corner by the stairs. There was a load of blood and I shouted at Peter, for Christ's sake, stop it. But Peter said, he's got the cash and I want it. I took the watch off the table when I ran out of the house. I started the car and a little later, Peter came running out of the house and jumped into the car. He was covered in blood. I drove away and we were followed by a car for about 20 miles, but I'm a good driver and I managed to lose him. I was going around corners at 75 and Mary told me to slow down. You've seen what's in Mary's basket. 
It's Peter's coat, the one he was wearing on the job. We were going to get rid of it. Peter burned his shirt in the grate at home. We then went to Liverpool and Peter got £10 on the bank books that he took from Jack's house. We dumped the car at Ormskirk. Peter did the thumping. These are the clothes I was wearing at the time and you can examine them but you will not find any blood on them. I know what you've got up there. I left my raincoat and my keys behind. There is a bronze medallion on the key ring with my name on. But if I wanted, I could have just said that my coat had been stolen and that my keys were in it and no judge in the country would convict me. But I'm glad I've got it off my chest. I got that driving licence you asked me about from the car that we took. So a lot to unpack there. Briefly, Gwyn is saying that he just casually asked his friend, his friend's wife and their two young children to have a trek from Preston to Worthington, which is about two hours away, late at night, just so he could ask another friend to borrow some money. Then when he sees Peter attacking Jack, instead of physically trying to get Peter off of his good friend of five years, Gwyn instead steals Jack's watch, runs out of the car, sits and waits, and then when Peter returns covered in blood, speeds off, essentially saying that he has no idea what happened inside of the house. As you probably suspect, the police were not buying it. During Peter Allen's first interrogation, he was sticking with his story that he was at home all night with Mary, Gwyn and the children, even detailing that they went to bed between half nine and ten o'clock, directly contradicting Gwyn saying that they left Preston after ten. When he wouldn't budge or offer any sort of truth, the officer said, fine, we'll go and talk to Mary. And hearing this, Peter punched the table, put his head in his arms, took a breath and began to speak. He said, quote, I'll tell you what happened. It started off as an innocent robbery. All right. Monday night, about 9.30pm. We went to a garage in Preston and pinched a car. I picked the wife and the babies up, but the wife didn't know what was going on. We came up here, and when we got up here, Sandy went in. We got here at 1.10am. This bloke knew Sandy. Sandy said he had money lying around. We parked the car in the front of the roadworks. He went in, and he came out for me at about 10 to 3, and I went in. Sandy told him that he wanted some fresh air and he let me in without the chap knowing but when he came down the stairs he saw me so I hit him. Sandy had the bar and he gave it me. Sandy put the light out and I was hitting out blindly. I only had my fists until Sandy gave me the bar. I only hit him twice with it then gave it back to Sandy. I went upstairs to see if there was any loose cash, but there wasn't. There was a bunch of letters and two bank books in the drawer, and I just grabbed the lot. The wife and children were asleep in the car. We went straight down the road towards Cockermouth. I threw my gloves out the window. When we got to Windermere, we ran out of petrol, but Sandy got some. We went on to Kendall, and the wife cashed her family allowance, and we went straight to Liverpool to see my mum. On the way back, we left the car in a yard, a builder's yard near the bus depot. We got a bus back. Yesterday, Sandy got two five pounds from a bank in Liverpool. The wife went to the door with him. When I got back, I scrubbed my jeans and burnt the letters. Sandy took the chap's watch and jacket and he left his own coat in the house. I'll tell you this, I'm glad you found me. Sandy said it was an easy touch. Who am I to take a human's life in my hands? All I wanted was £100 for a deposit on a house. He would go on to provide a written statement where he added even more detail saying, quote, I went in and shut the door and went upstairs. As I got near the top of the stairs, Mr. J.A. West came out of the bedroom and saw me and he lunged at me and I panicked. I hit him in the face with my fist and he fell to the landing at the top of the stairs. The next thing I remember was seeing Gwyn hit him with the rubber hosepipe. Mr. West then fell down the stairs. 
Gwyn and I both went down to see if we could find anything, then I went back upstairs to see if I could find any money, leaving Gwyn downstairs. Peter would also include how apologetic he felt about what he had done and the genuine relief that he had been caught because he couldn't have lived with himself. So now the police have two different accounts of what happened on the 7th of April. So, who do they believe? They go back to the evidence to see if that is able to corroborate any of the men's stories. Starting off with Gwyn, he says that they left Preston at about 10am and arrived at Jack's at about 3am, so that's a five hour gap. That doesn't make sense though, because according to Google Maps, this journey should have only taken about two hours. So what were they doing for the other three? Because he didn't mention any stops between Preston and Jack's house. He also said that they arrived there at 3am. He went in, him and Jack are sat having a cuppa and a cheese scone. But that doesn't make sense either, really, because Joseph Fawcett would recall hearing the thumping at about 3am. Him and his wife went down to try and investigate. They saw the car leaving and they rang police at about half three. So this cupper and a cheese scone must have literally happened within the first couple of seconds of him entering the house. So that story doesn't really make any sense. It couldn't possibly fit into the timeline. So it's safe to assume that that was a lie. Also, at the scene, there was no evidence that Jack had been sat down with anyone and no evidence of anyone eating a cheese scone. If they were sat having a cup of eating a cheese scone, they would have found cups of tea at the scene. They would have found plates out and potentially even a cheese scone sat on a plate, but they didn't find anything like that. The only sort of food that was found at the scene was the bacon that Jack had left out. Whereas in Peter's statement, he said that they arrived at Jack's house not long after 1am, that Gwyn had went in and he came back out for Peter at about 10 to 3. That would make more sense. Personally, I'm still a bit unsure about the whole cup of tea and cheese scone thing, but if Gwyn did get there just after 1am, I guess he would have had time to eat it and clear it away before the murder took place. Evidence extracted from the scene proved that with certainty, Gwyn had been in the house. His fingerprints were everywhere. Some of his hair was even found in a comb, so he had took time to brush his hair for some reason. Apparently, they weren't able to find any fingerprints or palm prints belonging to Peter, but I don't find that too outlandish, as within his statement, he does mention that he wore gloves. During Jack's autopsy, underneath his fingernails, fibres were extracted that matched fibres from a coat that belonged to Mary. So, could Peter have worn his wife's coat and these fibres were underneath Jack's fingernails because he was trying to fight back? That makes sense with something that was mentioned in Gwyn's statement. He said, you know what's in Mary's basket, it's the coat that Peter wore on the job. So that's a little bit of truth from his statement. Jack West was found only wearing a shirt and vest. So if he and Gwyn had been sad, having a cuppa and a chase scone, and Peter's knocking at the door, Jack doesn't know who it is, how likely is it that Jack's gonna go and answer the door half naked? I would assume very unlikely. Jack's bottom set of dentures were found on the landing upstairs, which supported Peter's written statement of the attack beginning up there on the landing, and that also supported Joseph Fawcett's account of watching the lights flicker on and off after he heard the thuds. He recalled the light being turned on and off upstairs first and then downstairs. However, one thing that was sticking out to police, one thing that neither of the men had mentioned was any sort of knife or the fact that Jack had been stabbed. However, they wouldn't need to wait too much longer for the knife to be brought up. During his second interrogation, Gwyn pretty much mirrored his previous statement. However, this time, he mentioned a knife, saying, quote, I don't have to use a knife to kill a man. I'm an expert at judo and karate. I know Peter always carried a knife or a kosh in his pocket or belt. Does that sound like deflection to any of you or is it just me? Mary Allen would be questioned by police and they discovered that she was truly innocent in any part of the murder. She had no idea what was going to happen to Jack. 
Despite her not being present in the house when the killing took place, it was still important to get her side of the story as she may be able to fill in some blanks or support either Gwyn or Peter's version of the story. She told investigators, quote, Sandy got out of the car at the top of the avenue, walked down to the house, and from there, we were sitting. This is Peter and I. We were both in the car. I saw the reflection of the house lights on the other side of the road. Half an hour after, Sandy just came back up to the car. He told Peter that he had told his mate that he had Peter with him and he said that his mate said it was okay if he could bring Peter in for a drink. Peter argued for a bit about leaving me alone in the car. Then eventually he went with him. About 10 to 15 minutes elapsed when they both came back to the car, but they were running. So Mary's story matches Peter's statement more than Gwyn's. She is stating that Gwyn did go into the house first and then physically walked back to the car to bring Peter inside. Gwyn wasn't unsuspecting and not knowing what was going to happen. He had thought out this plan and he knew what they were going to do, whether Peter did or not. I know the investigation sounded really extensive and time consuming and a really long process. However, everything I just described and more that I couldn't even delve into happened in less than 72 hours. On the 9th of April, 1964, Gwyn Owen Evans and Peter Allen were charged for the April 7th murder of John Allen West. Shortly after the arrests, Mary spoke to police again. Now, I believe the news were reporting that Jack had sustained a stab wound and this triggered a memory for Mary. She told police how after driving away from Jack's home, they were driving through Windermere and they had pulled over and that Sandy had disposed of something over a low wall, which was between two hotels, one of them being called the Mountain Ash Hotel. Mary went with officers to try and narrow down the area and within two hours, with the help of a sniffer dog named Union, they were able to retrieve a three inch long red handled knife which was covered in blood. Later examination would confirm that this was the same blood type as Jack West and I'm sure that this knife also matched a set that Jack had in his kitchen. Gwyn and Peter's trial began at Lancaster Assizes. After hearing six days worth of evidence from over 40 witnesses, the jury took just short of four hours to deliver their verdict. They found both men guilty of the capital murder of John Allen West and both were sentenced to death. Gwyn and Peter would both appeal their convictions but both were denied. Quick side note as well that all throughout the trial, Mary was writing love letters to Gwyn and it came out in the trial that they were more than just friends. It's believed by many that had Gwyn pled diminished responsibility that he may have been spared the death penalty as he had a history of mental health issues from being only 10 years old. However, this plea was never put forward by the defence in the trial or the appeal. It's also believed that if this crime had been committed just a few weeks later, the men would have never been handed a sentence of death. 8 a.m. on the 13th of August, 1964, only 59 years ago, Gwyn Owen Evans and Peter Allen were executed by hanging. Double executions were no longer allowed in the UK, so Gwyn was hanged at Walton Gwall in Liverpool and Peter in Strangeways Gwall in Manchester. Only 15 months later, the UK would abolish the death penalty before executing anyone else, making Gwyn Owen Evans and Peter Allen the last two men to be hanged in the UK. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to leave me a nice review and to follow the podcast wherever you're listening. I would appreciate that so much. You can follow the podcast over on Instagram at True Crime Caitlin Pod, where I'll be posting images relating to all of the cases and for any updates. Make sure you tune in again next week for a brand new episode.